a traditional animator who is thinking about transitioning into the digital medium? Or are you already a digital hand-drawn animator who is interested in having a more classical approach to their animation? Or do you just want to learn hand-drawn animation because you don't have the proper equipment for it and that the digital medium is your only option? This is Abraham. He's a veteran animator. All of his animation career, he has been a traditional hand-drawn animator. Abraham loves animating on paper, but he knows the industry has been leaning towards digital methodology and is interested in its potential. This is Bonbon. Bon. He's an aspiring animator who wants to learn from the greats of the previous generations before him. He's still a newbie in animation, but he's pretty adept when it comes to utilizing modern tools. Bonbon bon wants to transfer classical hand-drawn animation habits and skills to the new age. One day while Abraham was mentoring Bonbon, bon, Bonbon bon showed Abraham the digital softwares he was using for 2D animation. Abraham never knew that there are so many different softwares one could use to make quality animation. Bonbon bon showed him the tools such as digital playback or playing on the go. Millions of colors to choose from, nifty tools, nifty brushes, infinite frames, faster ways to handle problems, and many amazing tools a traditional animator could dream of. All of this blew Abraham's tiny and old Scottish Terrier Maltese mix brain away. The old dog knew this thing had limitless possibilities. However, he realized while all of these tools do sound amazing, they can lead to some very bad habits. Bonbon bon looked at him in confusion, in which Abraham got up and responded, With great power comes with great responsibility. Today's episode will be focused on traditional animation habits to keep and maintain in the digital hand-drawn animation phase. I managed to get a hold of my mentors, my peers, and buddies of mine to make a collective list on what skills and habits a 2D animator should have when applying a traditional animation aesthetic in their work. These are advices given and ranging from independent artists to major studio animators. It's great to know that we shared a lot of common thoughts regarding this topic. So, the stuff I'll be relaying here is based off what were the ones that were commonly said by the thoughts I've gathered. Since I'll be making videos regarding 2D animation, I decided to make this one right now since there'll be a lot of things that I'll come back to in the future. Today's guest star is Lorelei, submitted by Clara Cornish. From the looks of it, she's a preteen to a young teen with a set of nunchucks. Her rugged look displays her rough demeanor and makes the viewer assume that she's an outdoor person who loves some adventure now and then. Little details like that can say a lot about the character already. Another thing I really like about this design is that not only can you read the character's personality, but it does remind me of two styles from artists I really admire. Jamie Hewitt in Design Aesthetic and Proportion and Katsuhiro Otomo. Well, more of Katsuhiro Otomo's earlier works. You can see in Clara's face. With those in mind, I did my own studies of her character, trying to understand the design approach to Lorelei. In the original drawings, they were a bit more ambiguous in terms of proportion, but that's totally fine. The inspiration for me was there, and it's really just me trying to understand or find a middle ground for the character. Anyways, if you guys have the time, go check out Clara Cornish's work. I provided a link to her page down below. Anyway, let's get started. Number 1. More flipping and rolling. First of all, what are they? In traditional animation, rolling is a technique where you put your fingers in between your drawings and simply roll them throughout. This is great for seeing a short segment of animation come into motion. Flipping is the constant toggle between frames and is used usually to keep track of how much change there is in shape and accent. This is a great way to notice arcs and change in dimension. When traditional animators want to make breakdowns in specific in-betweens, they place two fingers in between the next and previous drawings with the in-between drawing on top of those pages then using your fingers, you flip between the drawings rapidly so you can see the change in shape and form. Can you transfer this procedure into digital medium as well? Depending on what software you use and how familiar you are with it, you can totally achieve the same feeling. This then leads to my next point. Less usage of the light table and the onion skinning tool. The light table is used so that animators can see multiple drawings and pages at once. In Flash and other digital softwares, this is also known as the onion skinning tool and allows animators to see multiple frames at once. Although we have access to these tools, 
depending on these tools alone is a bad habit to have. I'm not saying you should stray away from these tools all the time because they are just as well important, but depending only on them is problematic, and here's why. Okay, here I'm just gonna do a straight in between, in between these poses and I'm just gonna eyeball it. Here and there, okay, let's do it, do that, okay. Alright, now let's see how that drawing relates to the main poses. Oh my god, what the hell is that? It looks like shit, it looks muddy, what gives? It's because I didn't really give attention to actually observing the relationship to the shape and form change of my subject, and that is an advantage that flipping and rolling techniques have in your animation. So my rule of thumb is, don't use a light table when you're making breakdowns or anything with huge spacing. This is because relying on the light table or the onion skinning tool, you disregard things like arcs or change in form, consistency in proportions, and making sure the accents are in track. The times I find myself using the light table is when I'm seeing relationships between all the drawings in terms of spacing or when I need to in between something that has a very tight spacing. So I do need to be more accurate at this point. Number 3. Less cutting and pasting as opposed to redrawing. Let's say you're someone who wants to master hand-drawn animation and having great drawing technical skill. While cutting out heads and limbs and pasting them in another frame can save a lot of drawing time. Have you noticed how uncanny this looks? This stuff is great if you're trying to achieve something that's cheap or you don't have a lot of time with it, or that you are trying to achieve a comical effect because this thing can look really funny and can really work. The reason I bring this up is that the idea of redrawing things is supposed to train you in becoming a better draftsman. You're training your eye to recognize and repeat shapes and that you can always recreate something that can always be lost. However, depending on how you do use this tool, you can do wonders and save a lot of time. However, if you really want to shoot up your drawing skills and maintain that traditional animation look and discipline, then you're probably going to want to challenge yourself to redraw things more. Number 4. Less use of the distortion and manipulation tools as opposed to redrawing. Similar to my previous point, some animators use this method to again, cut corners. I personally do not have a problem with this method, as it is ideal for storyboard artists who need to draw a lot but just for the sake of pre-production. But when it does come to production animation, it does limit your drawing and acting sensibilities. To me, good hand-drawn animation has a lot of strong and contrasting drawings, and that type of stuff requires things to be redrawn. In order to push certain acting decisions and poses, you need to apply change to everything within the drawing. While I personally don't have any problem with such tools, I do encourage anyone trying to learn how to become a better 2D animator to start redrawing more. Number 5, which I find very important, plan your work. Don't overdo your trial and erroring. While there are some cases where you can just wing through your work, there will be times where you might tell yourself, this could have been pushed more, this could have been explored more, and that you'll constantly make changes again and again until you get something that you like. Trial and erroring is a thing you'll find in the animation world, but it's also very time consuming. When you make your drawings, you want to be decisive. That's the important word, decisiveness. Planning your animation before actually animating it is the best way to find problems you might encounter during your animation process. For example, since I know there are lots of acting choices you can choose from, I usually do little thumbnails of my poses to see what fits best for the scene. Why not act it out? Shoot yourself a video reference and study it. Maybe use an exposure sheet to plan out the timing of your poses. There are many ways to plan, but the important thing here is to plan and make less guesses. Be more decisive. Have a clear idea on what you want to communicate once you start animating. Number 6. Keep your drawings loose in the beginning. While it is tempting to have the most detailed drawing in the first pass, remember, at this stage, you're pretty much animating gestures. You want to be as clear as you can be, so you have to be bold in your drawings. Therefore, you're drawing the rawest energy of your subject, and that can be just pure shape language in this case. Keep your drawings loose and give yourself more freedom in pushing your performance. Don't worry about having their color consistent or the details of their watch 
or whatever they have on them, focus on giving your character an engaging performance. You can figure out their form, their shapes, and their little shit later on. Remember, draw more shorthand versions of your character, more graphic representations of them. You give yourself more freedom to push the performance this way. Also, it's just faster to get a point across. So having loose drawings are the way to go. Number 7. Just keep drawing when you're not animating. If you want to have looser drawings, you're going to need to be more comfortable with drawing in general. Live drawing, cafe sketching, character sketching, doodles, just keep drawing. Set yourself drawing challenges like drawing more fast gestures, drawing 20 people a day, or study the nooks and cranny of your subject. Having good drawing skills requires good observation. Observation is the key word here. Translate your studies and observation into your animation drawings. Observation leads to believability. Believability is good because it makes your animation come to life. When this happens, it makes people believe they exist and they can relate to them. This is engagement. I made this entry because I love hand-drawn animation. But I can also understand why such a practice can be seen as outdated. Does this mean that the skills and habits of traditional animation should be left behind? The opposite. I do feel like in order for hand-drawn animation to stay alive, we need to respect the things that made it great and the new things we could bring using digital mediums. If I were to give an advice to anyone who wanted to animate in a more traditional style, I would advise them to try and animate traditionally. Doing that removes every advantage digital medium has, and will enable new animators to think more critically about their work. Once those people transition into the digital world, most of the discipline will already be at their hand, and the nifty tools the digital medium has to offer will just be additional icing on their main cake. Anyways, thanks for watching, and happy animating. More to come as always.